data generation and aspects of real life CFD analysis. This module would be our last one in this introductory course. And we would focus very briefly on two topics. The first one is introduction to grid generation, which is an essential part of numerical simulation procedure. And the next part would be the aspects of practical CFD analysis. What are the things which we must keep in mind while carrying out a real life CFD analysis for a complex geometry problems? So, these are two aspects which we will deal with or will briefly touch upon in this concluding module of our course on computational fluid dynamics. So, we have broken this module into two lectures. The first one would cover grid generation and the second one we will take up the aspects of validation and verifications which are essential for any industrial or research CFD analysis. So, let us have a look at first lecture in this module. Introduction to grid generation, we will basically cover briefly the types of grids which are there, which are normally used in CFD analysis and generation process in brief and we would briefly discuss about advanced material which you can refer to to develop expertise in grid generation. This being an introductory course, we have no intention of introducing the actual numerical techniques which are used in CFD analysis. We would cover only the basic theoretical aspects and uh, that is where we would leave this particular lecture. So, now let us have a look at the lecture outline. We will first formally look at what we call a grid that is definition of grid or mesh. Then we would briefly touch upon the classification of grids. Then overall grid generation process, what are the steps involved in grid generation and then we will look at two types of grid generation processes, a structured grid generation and unstructured grid generation. Now, let us see how do we define a grid or a mesh. Both of these terms are interchangeably used in CFD literature. Grid is more common in numerical techniques dealing with finite difference or finite volume applications and mesh is the term which is most popular in finite element based CFD analysis. So, how do you define what is a grid or a mesh? When we are solving continuum problem, we would solve a partial differential equation which is defined over a finite continuum domain. Now, that continuum domain contains infinite number of points. Grid is essentially the discretization of this continuum domain for numerical simulation. So, we would discretize that is to say we would approximately represent our continuum domain by a set of discrete points. Now, in mesh based methods for instance finite difference, finite volume or finite element techniques, these discrete points are not arbitrary, they are connected in a certain way. So, that is what we call a mesh. So, a mesh or grid is a set of connected points distributed over the problem domain for a numerical solution of a partial differential equation. And uh, in our CFD analysis, which type of grid or mesh we would use, that would depend on the discretization technique which we imp employ, that is whether we use finite difference method or finite volume method or finite element method. So, that is one aspect which will control the choice of the grid. The second would be the geometry of the problem domain and specifically the grid gradation that would also be influenced by the underlying physics of the problem. The gradients of the flow variables would be one of the essential pro features of which will influence our grid design. Now, we would use a structured grid for finite difference method. Most often we go for a Cartesian 
structural grid in finite difference analysis. Other option in finite differences could be that we could go for body fitted grid in which case our computational domain where finite difference method is applied that is still a Cartesian mesh, but that is mapped to our complicated problem geometry and that mapping gives us what we call a body fitted structured grid. So, this would we would use structure grid for finite difference method. Finite element and finite volume methods, they can work with either structured or unstructured grids. We will have a look at the formal definition about these grid types little later in the lecture. Now, in finite volume or finite element analysis, when we are using unstructured grids, we have to take few precautions. So, care must be taken to ensure proper grading of the grid. By grading, we mean the size distribution of the mesh elements in different regions of the problem domain. We would have to ensure that we have finer meshes close to the problem boundaries or solid boundaries where we expect very large gradients to the flow variables and coarser grades away from the boundaries. Similarly, we have also got to make sure that the finite what we call finite elements or finite volumes, they have got proper geometric structure and that leads to a term which we call quality of the mesh. The quality of the mesh is defined in terms of the angles which are contained in the elements and the size gradation in the mesh. So, both of these features will affect our overall quality of the mesh and unless we have got a good quality mesh, the numerical errors in the discretization process would spoil our numerical solution. In fact, even convergence may be badly affected if we do not have a properly graded and good quality mesh. In addition, specifically in three dimensional situations, we have got to make sure that all parts of the interior of the problem domain are contained in, a, in an element. That is to say, the creation of elements has not left what we call wires in our continuum domain, because then that would lead to severe problems in numerical simulation. It might invalidate our entire numerical simulation itself. So, this grid or mesh which we design that is strongly affects the accuracy of the numerical solution and hence a significant effort is usually invested in generation of a suitable grid. So much so, that if we are dealing with industrial CFD problems, wherein we would encounter complex geometries. So, in such cases, mesh generation process may consume nearly 50 percent of the overall simulation time. Sometimes, it may so happen that more than 50 percent time may be taken by the geometry modeling and a suitable good quality mesh generation process. So, that is nothing surprising because that is the starting point, that is the foundation of uh, the CFD analysis. We have to generate a proper computer representation of the complex geometry of the problem and we have to come up with a good quality mesh. Only then, the numerical solution which you would get can with any confidence represent an approximation of the physics of the problem. Now, let us have a look at the basic classification of the grid. We would have a look at only broad classifications. There are many other classifications or subclassifications for each type. So, we are not going to those details in this lecture. We would have a look at what we call the broader or top level classification of the grids. So, majority of the grids can be broadly put into the following three categories. The first one is what we call a structured grid, where there is a specific structure which is imposed by the grid lines whose intersection represents our grid nodes. And the next category is what we call block structured grids, wherein we do not have a single structured grid in over our problem domain, but we might have broken up a problem into a set of blocks, but over each block we have got a structured grid. Now, 
The nature of this structural grid is gradation that might differ from one block to another. And the last one is what we call unstructured grid, wherein there is no fixed connectivity between the grid points. There might be some interior grids which might have say four neighbors in a 2D problem or they might have more than four neighbors. So, number of neighboring nodes, their orientation, this would all be unstructured or unfixed that will not be precisely defined in the case of unstructured grids. Let us have a look at each of these type in bit more detail. So, what do you mean by a structured grid? In a structured grid, grid points follow a fixed structure. In particular, the grid points are located at the intersection of what we call grid lines. Hence, each grid point can represent the origin of a local coordinate system. We will have a graphical representation of these concepts very soon. Okay. And uh, the interior grid points in a structured grid, they have a fixed number of neighboring points unlike an unstructured grid where each interior grid point might have a differing number of neighboring points. And uh, the grid points can be represented by a set of indices corresponding to intersecting grid lines. In fact, this aspect we have already discussed very briefly when we were dealing with finite difference discretization. We will revise these concepts once again. And uh, if you look at the geometrical nature of the structural grids, they contain of elements which can be mapped to a rectangle in two dimensions or a parallel pipette in three dimensions. Now, here we are talking about a generic structured grid which could be Cartesian, which could be body footed or which could be curvilinear. So, irrespective of the type of structural grid or the nature of the structural grid which we have got, any grid element in 2D can be mapped to a rectangle and a parallel pipette in three dimensions. Thus, all grid lines are oriented regularly in either two or three directions, so that coordinate transformation of curvilinear lines results in rectangle in 2D and parallel pipette in 3D. Now, these grids could be Cartesian, that is the simplest possible grid. Cartesian grids are preferred for simple rectangular geometries, but recently Cartesian grids are also used for arbitrarily complex geometries in conjunction with immersed boundary techniques. We will have a brief look at the use of Cartesian grids for complex geometry problems in the next lecture. The other one is what we call body fitter grid for domains with curved boundaries. Now, again body fitter grids might have two types of grids. The first one is what we call orthogonal grids in which curvilinear grid points or grid lines are perpendicular at grid points. That is to say they intersect each other orthogonally. That is why it is called an orthogonal grid. Or other possibility is what we call non-orthogonal grid in which curvilinear grid point lines intersect obliquely. The angle between the grid lines is not 90 degree at the grid points. Now, let us have a look at the geometric details of these structural grids in our board. We will first illustrate some of the concepts which we just discussed using 2D Cartesian grids. So, in 2D Cartesian grids, let us say this is our x, y axis, our grid lines would be parallel to these axis lines. So, let us draw a set of grid lines. These are what we call y grid lines which are parallel to x axis. Similarly, let us have an intersecting set of grid lines which are perpendicular to these y grid lines or what we call x grid lines. Now, if we had a rectangular problem domain, of course, that is where the structured grid 
is most natural to use. Now, each of these grid lines can be identified by an integer index, which will correspond to our x locations. For instance, let us say a generic point here, this vertical grid line, which corresponds to x is equal to x i. Now, so this particular grid line is what we call x is equal to x i or ith grid line. Similarly, so suppose this is what this line has got the equation y is equal to y i sorry y j. So, we would use two different indices i for x direction and j for y direction. So, the intersection point of these two grid lines that can be identified by two unique indices i comma j in two dimensions. If we had a three dimensional problem, we will have eight another grid line, let us say z is equal to z k grid line which intersects at this point and the index of the point would be i comma j comma k. Now, if you look at this grid point, it has got a fixed number of neighbors, two neighbors on the top and bottom and similarly two neighbors along x direction, what we call east or west or so, so east neighbor whose grid indices are i plus 1 comma j and number them E p, this is w, this index is i minus 1 comma j and northern neighbor with an index i j plus 1 and southern neighbor i j minus 1. So, whichever grid point we take, it does not matter any of these internal grid points will have the same number of neighbors. So, these are all our grid points and you pick up any grid point, the number of neighbors is fixed and 2D, we will have four number of neighbors for each interior grid point. We have used the word interior specifically because if we are at the boundary point, so suppose we are at any of these boundary nodes, the number of neighbors might be less than 4. So, depending on the location on the boundary, we might have a different number of neighbors for the boundary nodes. So, that is why we said we talk only in terms of the interior grid points. So, this is our typical Cartesian grid. So, each grid point is expressed by indices i comma j in 2 d or i comma j comma k in 3 d. Similarly, we have also seen that number of neighboring points is fixed, it is 4 in 2 d, that is we have got i plus 1 comma j, i minus 1 comma j, i j plus 1 and i j minus 1, these are indices of the neighboring points for an interior node. Similarly, we can see the same thing happens, similar set of indices or number of neighbors would be 6 
in 3D, it is u i plus 1 j comma k, i minus 1 j comma k, i j plus 1 k, i j minus 1 k, i j k plus 1 and i j k minus 1. Similarly, what we can see you, you pick up any interior node. Now, that interior node can itself be thought of as if it is origin of a local coordinate system x prime y prime. So, the state and the fundamental feature of all the structure grids that any grid point can be taken as a local origin of a coordinate system. Now, the Cartesian grids they are by nature orthogonal. We can also have orthogonal grids in curvilinear plane as well. For instance, if we have an annular domain suppose this is our annular domain defined by two concentric circles. Now, in this case it does not make sense for us to define rectangle or use rectangular Cartesian grids. We might better use r theta coordinates x y instead we will use the polar coordinates. And we can draw different theta lines. So, here our grid points would be defined at the intersections of the theta lines. Defined by intersection of theta and r lines. So, r lines would be basically concentric circles and theta lines would be the radial lines. And each of these curvilinear elements which we get here, so suppose we take this curvilinear element, it can be mapped to a rectangle corresponding to its r and theta values. So, once again here if you look at same sort of properties apply that this again an orthogonal mesh r and theta line they intersect orthogonally. So, this is one example of orthogonal curvilinear grid okay. now let's have a look at a bit more complicated one or what we call a generic body fitted grid suppose we had a fairly strange region a very complicated region with a hole in a inside now what we can do is again we can identify our curvilinear coordinates and draw those their curvilinear grid lines. Now, these curvilinear grid lines they might follow our surfaces fairly closely that is why they are called body fitted grids. And depending on mapping, we might have an orthogonal or non orthogonal grid. So, this, say, refinement, we might have more number of 
curvilinear lines. So, this these grids could be orthogonal or non orthogonal. Let us have a, a look at one more non orthogonal grid, where non orthogonality would be evident. Now, this grid we would generate let us say in flow area between a set of tubes in let us shell and tube height exchange. So, this is quarter of one of the tubes and then other side we have got a quarter of and the tube. This is how this area would look like. This is our flow domain. Here what we have got is our one tube here and the tube here. And because of symmetry there are lots of tubes present in the flow domain, we would just concentrate in our flow analysis on this solid region. Now, how do we generate a grid in this particular domain? We might divide it into three different sub regions and then we start off with our structural grid generation process. Let us choose So, this is our one set of grid lines. In structural grids on the corresponding faces, we must have equal number of grid points. So, you can clearly say here that the grid lines do not intersect orthogonally Now, let us have a look at the next category of what we call block structured grids. Block structure grids are used in complex geometries, wherein generation of a body fitted structure grid may be very difficult over the entire problem domain. So, for sake of simplicity, what do we do? That we decompose our problem domain into smaller blocks, and over each block, we can generate a structured grid. So, decompose the problem geometry in a set of blocks which we call subdomains or and generate a structured grid in each block separately. And the grid structure in each block can be different. We might have a Cartesian grid in one block, curvilinear grid in another block. So, there is no restriction whatsoever in the block structural grids. And we can have different mesh densities in different regions of a space and thus fine grids can be easily put in the regions likely to show spe steeper gradients of the problem variables. And not just that, the blocks can even be overlapping. Such blocks or such block structure grids wherein we have got overlapping problem domain, they are called composite or chimera grids. So, now this is one typical example 
taken from a rotating flow machinery. So there are different blades and each blade here has got a mesh of different density and the structured grid on each one was generated separately. And similarly, in the region which is filled here, there is a different set of structured grid. You can see that the structures also, the way the layout of the grid also is different in different regions of the domain. To take another example of these block structured grids, let us have a look at how we would use Cartesian grid for flow over an airfoil. So, suppose this is our airfoil and so a computational domain or flow domain over which we would solve for the flow variables. Okay. We can choose a fairly coarse mess to begin with. So, suppose this is our coarsest set of grid lines. Let us define our vertical grid lines as well. Now, far away from the airfoil, the coarse grid might be okay, but not near the airfoil. So, what do we do? We can use finer blocks close to the surface or close to the body of the airfoil. So, we can define very fine grids So, for instance, this is one block. Now, this could be divided into separate sub blocks, and even in each sub block, we might have the grids of different densities. So, in fact, we can go for a hierarchy of such grid levels close to the surface of the airfoil, whereas bit away from the surface, we can do away with core circuit. So, this one typical way in which we can map all around the surface, we, we can have smaller blocks, def, break them into even smaller blocks and have even finer grids close to the surface. So, this will help in two ways, we are dealing with all, we can still keep ourselves to Cartesian grids, but by using finer and finer Cartesian grids close to the surface of the airfoil, we can get a better representation of geometry, that is one thing. Similarly, these finer grids would be able to resolve the higher gradients which are present in the flow field close to the surface of the airfoil. Similarly, where we expect the formation of the shock waves, we can again have very fine grid structures by defining local blocks with fine, very fine Cartesian grids therein. So, there are umpteen number of possibilities, I have just illustrated part of the block structured mesh generation around airfoil, we can fill in same procedure we can follow. Now, let us move on to the next category which we call unstructured grids. Now, these unstructured grids, they can be thought of as a limiting case of the structured grid or what rather our block structured grid in which each block becomes an element or a cell. And unlike structured grids, sides of a cell or element have no relation to the coordinate directions in unstructured grid. 
And usually in two dimensions, unstructured grids would consist of triangles or quadrilaterals in theory, triangles are the easiest ones to generate. Quadrilaterals specifically in finite volume analysis, uh, they result in better interpolation and integrations, integration and interpolation can be done more accurately with quadrilateral finite volumes in two dimensions. Similarly, in three dimensions, tetrahedra, tetrahedral elements are easier to generate, but hexahedral elements give us more control over the accuracy of interpolation and integrations. So, in general in 3D we have, we can have a collection of tetrahedra, wedge elements, hexahedra or even polyhedral elements. Now, polyhedral elements have recently picked up in finite volume analysis and some of the commercial softwares like star CD, they prefer to use this polyhedral elements in three dimensions. And uh, these unstructured grids are much easier to generate in complex domains and hence majority of commercial CFD solvers have adopted unstructured grid based solvers. In fact, these unstructured grid generators, they have been adopted as such from commercial finite element solvers which have traditionally used unstructured finite element maces. Now, in finite volume applications as I just mentioned, quadrilateral elements in 2D or hexahedral elements in 3D are preferred for better accuracy in interpolation and integrations. And this is one aspect which you must keep in mind while designing your grid for finite volume analysis of a problem. So, now this is one typical example of unstructured grid generated around a turbine rotor. So, you can see different uh, grid densities or different densities of what we call cells or meshes and different do parts of the problem domain. We have just shown the surface mesh and of course, the volume mesh is developed is started from the surface mesh if you are dealing with a flow analysis problem. And if you are dealing with the stress analysis problem, this is typical surface mesh for the structural part of our a rotor. So, in a fluid structure interaction problem, we will have two sets of meshes, but the starting surface mesh would be what we have shown here. The surface mesh looks a collection of triangles and of course, based on these triangles, we can generate the tetrahedral three dimensional elements. Now, next let us have a look at the overall grid generation process, which we will have to adopt for a real life problem. So, we will typically use this, this setup steps for complex geometries. What do we need to first do? Decompose the problem domain into a set of subdomains or blocks. It is immaterial whether we want to generate block structure grids or unstructured grids, this step should always be adopted. Okay. And in each block, generate the requisite grid. The requisite could, grid could be a structured one or unstructured one. For generating this grid in each block, the typical sequence of operations could be generate edge grid, that is to say divide the edges in desired number of one dimensional elements. Then use these edge grids to generate the grid on block surfaces. So, if you are dealing with 2D, that is where the things would be finished, but for 3D, we will proceed further that use surface grids as input to generate the volume mesh. So, if you want to generate a good quality mesh, that is a typical sequence of operations which we must follow. Some of the commercial grid generated programs will give you an option of generate a volume mesh as such. Just you click on a button, mouse button and it gives you a volume grid, but then you will have very little control over the gradation or the quality of such a grid. Whereas, if you follow this three step process, that is to say, the control the division of edges, that how many number of nodes you want along each edge, then generate a surface grid over all the surface of the block, we can have a much, much better control over the gradation as well as the quality of the volume mesh which is generated. So, once we have generated the mesh in each of the blocks, then we have to check for the mesh quality and then 
modify the mesh wherever required. So, that is a typical grid generation process which is adopted in real life CFD analysis. Now, let us have a brief look at the generation of the grids. We will first have a look at how structured grids are generated. Now, structured grid generation techniques they map a block with a curve boundary surface into a rectangular block. How do we achieve this mapping? This is basically achieved by computing physical coordinates of grid points which correspond to Cartesian grid points in transformed rectangular domain. Sometimes the word which we use is for this Cartesian grid space is what we call computational domain and physical domain which represents our actual physical geometry. Come up with the mapping. This mapping could be based on finite element shape functions, it could be based on transfinite interpolation or it could be based on solving system equations partial differential equations, it does not matter which way we use, but that is what we have to do. We have to generate a mapping and we can classify these uh, structural grid generation techniques into following categories. Algebraic techniques which use simple mapping schemes or interpolation functions, these can be used for both 2D and 3D. Conformal mapping which we have learnt in complex analysis class, but this can be used only in two dimensions. And then partial differential equation based methods, we can have an elliptic generation systems or hyperbolic systems which can be used in both 2D and 3D space. Now, these algebraic methods they generate geometric data of the Cartesian coordinates in the interior of a domain from the values specified the boundary through interpolations or a specific functions of curvilinear coordinates. These interpolations could be what we call transfinite interpolations or more complex finite element shape functions. And this is one of the most popular techniques, it is very simple to program, that is why it is very popular technique. So, this is one typical example here, we had a problem domain which is outside, maybe this is one of the solid tubes and this is our flow domain. We want to generate a restructured mess, so on each side we have now got to fix the number of points which we want to have and these numbers should be same as the number of points on the opposite side. So, here let us say we have got three divisions, three divisions on the opposite side, this has to be mapped, sorry this is three, this is three here. Here we have got one, two, three, four, five and six divisions. So, these six divisions would be mapped to the six divisions here using transfinite interpolation and this is what our mesh generated would look like. So, a structured mesh is clearly non-orthogonal structured mesh based on transfinite interpolation. Now, these algebraic techniques are usually very fast and simple to program, but they may not provide a very good quality mesh specifically if you are dealing with fairly complex geometries. So, this these are often used to provide initial guess to mesh generation methods based on partial differential equations, which would require us to provide with an initial guess of the grid points. Now, this PDE best methods they require solution of a partial differential equations in which dependent and independent variables are the physical and transform coordinates. Independent variables are the transform coordinates in the computational domain which will be a rectangular in 2D and a parallel pipet in 3D and the dependent variable would be x, y and z coordinates of the physical problem domain. Now, the PDE which we might solve that could be elliptic, hyperbolic or parabolic. Elliptic PDEs are normally used for closed problem domains and hyperbolic uh, would be used for infinite domains. And these techniques provide a good control over grid smoothness, orthogonality and grid spacing. We can have control functions specified as a part of the formulation. And this elliptic grid generation method they can employ either a Poisson or Laplace equation or used for bounded domains. Hyperbolic methods would be used for uh, generating orthogonal grids on unbounded domains. For further discussions, we will refer to you a few books towards the end of the lecture. Please have a look at the equations which are involved and how do we solve these equations to generate these structured grids. Next, let us have a very fleeting look at unstructured grid generation process. Now, unstructured grid generation process involves a systematic subdivision of the problem domain into or what we call sub blocks into cells of desired size and shape. For instance, triangles or quadrilaterals in 2D or tetrahedra or hexahedra in 3D. And many of these uh, methods employ decomposition of the geometry 
in triangular elements. Hence, collectively, this unstructured grid generation techniques are re also referred to as triangulation techniques. Though you might be generating a hexahedral mesh, but still, the generic name for the techniques is what we call triangulation techniques because that's how the things started off with that uh, generation of triangular elements in theory. Now let's have a look at some of the popular methods: advancing front method, quad tree or oak tree based methods, and Delaunay Voronoi based methods. In advancing front methods, we will start off with the boundary grid as in two dimensions or boundary face, which will be discretized in three dimensions, and that would be used as a starting base for what we call as front. Starting from that front, we would generate eight and the layer of nodes, which we call new points at certain distance from the set of grid points on this front to construct an element. Once that has been done, the process of point creation is repeated till a new layer of element based on the current front edge formed that becomes our new front. So, edge face formed by newly created nodes is taken as new front and the process is repeated until the entire domain has been decomposed into desired elements like this could be a typical sequence here. We have got this our boundary mesh. Let us take these two nodes and choose a certain height at which we want to generate the new layer of node C. So, generate these ones this would satisfy certain properties, generate a new layer until we have now filled up the entire problem domain with the elements of our choice. Now, the squad tree or arc tree based methods, they employ the Cartesian decomposition. They decompose the domain into regular partition of quadrilaterals rather squares and cubes and construct the mesh based on this regular decomposition. Like suppose this was our the outline will give us give you a rectangular decomposition or say bounding rectangle, keep on decomposing it into smaller smaller rectangles until we have got the nodes at these boundaries and thereby we have obtained a definition or decomposition of domain into elements of required size and shape. So, depending on where we are, we, uh, we will stop the decomposition process. For instance, here we are happy with this fairly large cartesian decomposition. Just add these two nodes to get the triangular mesh. If you want a rectangular mesh, we won't add these two nodes. We'll just have a simple rectangle element here. The same thing we can do here. We can create a partition here to get two quadrilateral elements and so on. Last category, this is one of the most fascinating ones, but also one, one of the most difficult to program. They are called Delaunay Voronoi methods. They generate a tessellation or what we call triangulation based on Voronoi polygons. So, these methods systematically decompose the problem geometry in a set of packed convex polygons or polyhedra based on Delaunay tessellations or they are also called Voronoi polygons. And for the details of these methods, please have a look at these references. You can find some quite elaborate detail in the computational fluid dynamics book by Chung. A recent book which is uh, dedicated to grid generation is by Lisekin, published in 2006. It is called Computational Differential Geometry Approach to Grid Generation. It ends the book for 3D based exclusively on Delaunay triangulation is that by Taniguchi, published in 2006, which gives you how to write an automatic mesh generation scheme. And uh, if you want to have compendium both structured as well as unstructured grid generation methods, the handbook of Thomson, Sony and Wetherill is a very good resource. You can find the collection of different chapters dealing with different types of grid generation procedures. An earlier version, a textbook by Thomson, Warsi and Master, this is a simpler one. So, maybe if you just want to have it start off, you can start off with Thompson's book and then you can refer to the handbook or go to Taniguchi's book or Leskin's book for further learning on aspects of grid generation.